Good evening, my name is Christian Anderson. I'm an associate professor of higher education at the University of South Carolina. So if I were to ask you, when did the University of South Carolina hire its first African-American professor? You might like, rightly remember that the university desegregated on September 11, 1963, and you might think, well, they probably hired someone who was African-American soon after that. In reality, it was nearly a century before that, nearly 100 years earlier. In the fall of, in the fall of uh, 1873, Richard T. Greener was hired as the University of South Carolina's first African-American professor. So who was Richard T. Greener? How did this happen, and why should we remember him? Born in 1844 in Philadelphia, he, was, uh, he went to school at Andover and Oberlin as preparatory schools and then was admitted to Harvard. He was Harvard College's first black graduate in 1870. Here in South Carolina, during the Civil, uh, after the Civil War, during Reconstruction, blacks gained the, the right to vote and soon occupied offices, political offices at every level. Black trustees were appointed to the University of South Carolina and they desegregated the campus. Then, in, on October 7th, 1873, Henry Hayne, who had been born into slavery and was at the time Secretary of State for the state of South Carolina, enrolled as the university's first black student. Carolina was the only institution in the South to desegregate uh, after the Civil War. And soon, the majority of campus was African American. That same fall was when Richard T. Greener was hired to teach mental and moral philosophy at the university, and he moved into Lieber House on the Horseshoe, just across from the library. But this young professor did much more than just teach his classes. He later enrolled in and graduated from the law school, the library that we now call the South Carolina Library, uh, was in disarray after the Civil War because of the war itself, because of the uses uh, that had, the building had gone through after the war, and because the librarian was not well equipped to organize the library because he uh, wasn't fluent in, or wasn't familiar with Latin and Greek, the primary languages of instruction at the antebellum South Carolina College. And one day in 1875, he just disappeared. He took off. Richard T. Greener just stepped up and took over as librarian. He reorganized the library, gave it its first modern cataloging, uh, effected several repairs and renovations, and uh, did this all with the help of his uh, able students. Of course, being fluent in Latin, Greek, and French helped him uh, in this effort. In addition to his teaching, his work at the library, and attending the law school, he also created a sub-freshman class, a preparatory school for young black students who were not well prepared for the rigors of college life. He lobbied the legislature and got 124 scholarships for these students. Um, he was also often called on by his peers to be a speaker, both on campus and off campus, and he used his oratory skills uh, as he traveled throughout the state and later throughout the country to advocate for civil rights and social change and social justice. Well, in 1877, former Confederate General Wade Hampton becomes governor. The federal troops leave, and he closes the university. The professors and the students are forced to leave. And at this point, it has been several months since the professors have actually been paid. The, the General Assembly later uh, rectifies this problem, except in the case of Richard T. Greener. He leaves the state of South Carolina being owed more than $1,500, nearly a year's salary uh, of, uh, of his pay. And remember those scholarships that Richard T. Greener helped obtain for the young students? 
when the university reopened in 1880, they were still available, but now to a whites only student body. Greener's post Carolina accomplishments are equally impressive. He taught and became dean of the School of Law at Howard University in Washington, D.C. He served on the Grants Commission, uh, uh, Memorial Commission in New York City. He served on several national boards and other committees. He was appointed as one of the country's first uh, diplomats of color and, and was appointed to serve in Vladivostok, Russia. And then later in his career, he worked as a lawyer in Chicago. Still, this history, his story is not well known. In fact, some years ago, in a class on the history of higher education, students asked, why don't we have something about Richard T. Greener on campus? Well, there is a scholarship about, of, in his name, and there is a portrait of him in the president's office, but these are not well known or well, uh, uh, they're, they're not uh, seen by many outside uh, in the university community. So we propose that a memorial should be erected in his honor. And I'm delighted to say that this fall, a statue will go up outside of the library in, uh, of Richard T. Greener. Also, we will host an annual symposium in his name. And given his uh, very, his very uh, career, we will never be at a, at a loss for topics. So finally, why should we remember him? We memorialize those whom we honor and who we value. If you walk around any campus or any other public space, such as the state capitals grounds, you will see memorials to those uh, who have served. And Greener certainly served with great distinction on the University of South Carolina campus. Not only being one of the first African-American professors, but doing it with great skill and ability. Representation matters, history matters, symbols matter, and those parts of our forgotten history need to be brought forward, better understood, and where appropriate, celebrated. It is also, I think, highly relevant. His story is also highly relevant to us today in 2017. And hopefully learning more about and from Richard T. Professor Richard T. Greener can be of some help to us today. Thank you.